Okay, well, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to today's panel from Caliphate to Global Insurgency, Islamic State Strategic Evolution and the Global Jihad. Uh, my name is Harry Ingram and I'm a senior research fellow with the program on extremism and I'll be chairing today's discussion which features an exceptional uh, panel. In order of appearance, we have General Terry Wolf, former Deputy Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL and currently the Director of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. Catherine Zimmerman, Resident Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I must recommend uh, Catherine's excellent article for the Hudson Institute uh, titled Al Qaeda after the Arab Spring, a decade of expansion, losses and evolution, uh, which I believe we have just posted to all those currently listening in on Zoom. And uh, Craig Whiteside, Associate Professor of the Naval War College. Uh, and indeed today uh, we are launching uh, the latest report in the ISIS Files series, Islamic State's Department of Soldiers, and written by Craig Whiteside, Anas Al-Alami, Murthy Muthuswami, and Aram Shabanian. For those joining us live on Zoom, um, we've uh, just provided a link to Craig's report. And uh, for the rest of you, uh, it is available on the program on extremism website. Now, I also wanna uh, take this opportunity to thank the George Washington University Libraries and Academic Innovation Team um, on behalf of the Program on Extremism for our ongoing partnership and collaboration. Under the leadership of Dean Geneva Henry, the GW Libraries and Academic Innovation Team has worked hard to maintain the running of the digital repository and uphold the ethical framework, which we collectively developed to guide the ISIS files project. Now, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to ensure that the thousands of documents in the ISIS files collection are processed appropriately, ethically and accurately, and the upcoming batches of files will be released in the near future. Uh, my thanks also to all of our partners that have been involved in the ISIS files project, and in particular to my colleague, Deborah Margol, and for her tireless efforts along the way. Finally, um, the format for today's panel will be that each speaker will have about 15 minutes for their opening remarks before we turn to a discussion and Q&A. As always, to our listeners, uh, please start posting your questions in the chat as we progress. There's no need to wait. Um, and I'll start to uh, incorporate those uh, into our discussion. Uh, so uh, to open today's panel, uh, we have General Wolf. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, good morning, everyone, and well, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, to Aurora, thanks for inviting me to participate in the seminar. I'm really honored to be on the stage with my, my fellow panelists, with Craig and Kate. It really, it really is an honor. Um, a special thanks, certainly, to the authors of the ISIS, uh, the ISIS files, the Islamic, Islamic State's Department of Soldiers paper, and for others, really, who helped with the research necessary to map um, the Islamic State's military and ideological stru struggle, and certainly the structure for sure. Uh, my perspective has been that we tend to be infatuated with violent extremists as organizations and their leaders. You know, in particular, we kind of gain visibility on them, but we don't tend to really understand their organizations and how they operate and what underpins them. And we don't spend enough time studying these violent extremist groups in insufficient depth. Additionally, in my opinion, that inside government, we don't tend to put the intellectual energy into continuing to study, you know, both Daesh and violent extremists. And it's, there's a belief that we've kind of been there and we've done that as if there isn't additional um, work to be done and things to be learned. You know, if you take a sampling kind of, 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 of how the Department of Defense is thinking, and certainly these are my opinions, the rage right now is great power competition, and I add a, as a corollary, regional power competition, and too many are willing to move off in that direction, really while not committing enough mainstream energy on these gray zone challenges, particularly the violent extremist issue that we're, we're here to talk about today. And I'll make, so I'll make six points based on, um, based on my thoughts about ISIS or Daesh after reading this wonderful paper. Um, the first point I would make is that the violent extremist challenge, the challenge with Daesh is really far from over. 
and we need further research and investigation into, into DASH. Um, and, and through public private um, works like, you know, like this, like other work that GWO is doing by supporting the posting of these documents for further use and study, we, we can learn a lot more. So this violent challenge, extremist challenge is far from over. My second point is that the last time I checked, DASH has not sued for peace. They haven't renounced their territorial or their global ambitions. I'm still haunted by that old um, Islamic State Caliphate map. Many of you remember it, which had black all over um, a great part of, of the Europe, North African, and Asian landmass. And if you remember that, can, that Caliphate map highlighted their ter territorial goals, and that included the Middle East and the Balkans, uh, Spain, North, Central, and East Africa, Central Asia, Iran, and certainly moving east through India into the edge of China. Um, and so with the work of this, of this paper, you all have helped fill the need, and that is to better understand Daesh's military structure and their ideological structure and how it evolved um, throughout the conflict to the present day. And by that, I mean the conflict continues. My third point is that the fight against ISIS has been different every single year. From the end of the Al-Qaeda in Iraq era to Daesh's efforts to stand up the physical caliphate to what has happened since their defeat two years ago at Belus. Um, the work in the paper, your work has described the foundations of their military structure from those early heydays and how they evolved to continue you know, to, to fight and also to conduct what I describe as Title X-like or Ministry of Defense functions. You know, the tasks associated with manning and recruiting and training uh, to employing a force uh, with a military capability, but also supporting that effort and keeping it on the straight and narrow. You know, you all have reinforced, have reinforced that Daesh is a learning organization. And that's my fourth point. Um, they saw their defeat coming in Mosul and Raqqa, and eventually down the Euphrates River Valley from Dar es Zor to Maidan to uh, the Abu Kamal Al Qaeda area. It wasn't it wasn't a big surprise. They could see you know they could see the punches that everyone was about to throw, and so they made decisions to live and fight another day. And consequently, they haven't been defeated strategically, in spite of what some leaders say, uh, and they've adapted. Uh, they've adapted the military instrument from the 2011 to 13 time frame, kind of in that era of, of unconventional and irregular warfare to a conventional fighting force. And obviously, they've made a mistake to stand and fight against the Iraqi security forces and their counterterrorism service, as well as the Syrian Democratic forces, all backed by the, by the global coalition and what it brought to bear. But then they moved back to the irregular warfare stage, you know, to regain strength. Um, and, and they're starting to slowly strike out where and when there is when there is less pressure. Likewise, we've kind of seen how they built, you know, their own air force with rotary wing and fixed wing drones. We've seen them employ chemical weapons. We've seen them keep their oil infrastructure up and running where and when they could. Uh, we've seen them use extortion extremely well to generate funds. We've seen them create a cyber force, and they built redundancy into the social media enterprise. My fifth point is that Daesh or ISIS has strategic depth. Um, and, and that's under, again, underpinned by the, the discussion of the key components of this paper. They saw their tactical defeat coming. They plan to survive by moving leaders out of the direct combat area, by having a leader succession plan. You know, the military calls that a leader down plan. Um, by offering, you know, by offshoring money, you know, in, in, into you know, into different sorts of locales and accounts, you know, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, by establishing, additionally, by establishing logistical uh, stockpiles in difficult terrain, um, and by adjusting their operational concept by focusing more outside of the core spaces of Iraq and Syria into branches and affiliates until the right time came to commence operations back in the core spaces. And we've seen that start to happen, that they're They've recommenced some operations at the low tactical level in at least five provinces in Iraq, around Raqqa, out in the uh, Badia Desert, and then certainly in areas around uh, Palmyra, where they continue to attack with pretty good success 
Syrian regime and Russian forces. I note that the research brought out in this paper helps us better understand that, that Daesh has stayed power, uh, which is that ideological component, which I found most compelling in the paper. And in it, you know, the, the authors have described why it's the glue which holds the Daesh enterprise together and the penetration by the, by, you know, leaders and, and all the way down to the platoon level into the recruitment and the structure in the management of the Department of Soldiers with all aspects, you know, not only in their daily lives, but more importantly, in my mind, establishing a system of command and control of fighting forces down to the platoon level, created a core, a core element of true believers that were indoctrinated on those religious concepts pertinent to their role in the fight. And if those of us who have tried to understand why 40,000 men and women went to Syria to fight either Assad or to join Daesh, um, explain that for a couple of reasons. We, you know, we always gave it a macro perspective, you know, why, uh, in terms of why people turn to the dark side. And there were lots of reasons regarding that. Sometimes it was internal pressures in nations. It was international factors. It was civil unrest. It was solidarity and commonality. It was social economic reasons. And sometimes there were other, other mobilized structures. The second component, though, is the micro reasons that came from being on the ground. You know, those rationales such as, you know, the caliphate as this Islamic idea of Islamic utopia, of religious legitimacy, of a winner's message of what was happening, of the camaraderie and adventure of that people who come together for a common cause. So here, so here's my sixth point. Um, what I what I failed in thinking about this over the years was that I missed a better understanding of that glue which held this ideolo ideological effort together. You know, we all know that ideas are an incredibly powerful force for sure, but what binds them? And I think in this paper, the authors have, offer, have offered insights that there was not only a process that held this ideal, ideological effort together, but there was a command and control mechanism in place as well. And as you state, as the author stated in the paper that you know, their critique that the Department of Soldiers failed at its primary task to prevent the loss of all of its territory and the destruction of its armies. My concluding note is that Daesh is a committed, adaptable foe. They're smart, they're a learning organization, and their integration, you know, and their, I'm sorry, their interpretation of the faith forms this ironclad ideology, which when married with committed leaders down to the lowest tactical level, and empowered by propaganda and social media, you know, can give local security forces a real run for their money. And it seems to me that's the benchmark, is, is the ability of, of the good guys and local security forces, can they adapt faster than the, the Daesh core groups or other violent extremist elements out of that branch and affiliate space? I think time will tell for sure. So I close by, um, by thanking the authors of the report um, and GW for their continued commitment to this sort of research and the posting of these documents, because I think it's needed for us to better understand these violent extremist groups. And so, Bararo, thank you very much for really giving me the opportunity to give you my perspectives. And what I took away, you know, thinking about Daesh in a more of a macro perspective after, after reading, uh, reading the paper. Back to you, please. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, General Wolf. Um, uh, the next uh, speaker we have this morning is uh, Katie. Uh, thank you, Katie. Great. Thank you, Harara. And let me just echo General Wolf's thanks to both the Program on Extremism and, and you and, and Craig for inviting me on this panel. I'm thrilled to be able to talk today about this topic and also really excited to dig into the ISIS files that have been made available through this, through this program. Um, I can't tell you how much as a researcher and an analyst what these primary sources mean to me uh, in, in the ability to understand the organization as it talks about itself. And you know, I think that when you look at the key analytical breakthroughs that have come, especially from researchers outside of the military and the intelligence community, it's come when these types of documents have been released, which are few and far between because they're either captured by the US military when we have troops on the ground and then declassified over the years um, or simply lost to time because they erode and nobody seems to care about the paperwork that these organizations leave behind. Um, so 
with that, um, I want to follow General Wolf's uh, fantastic opening remarks on, on this problem set and really um, talk about how I think the, the paper that we're discussing today, um, Craig and his co-authors, laid out a challenge to many of the assumptions that I've seen in terms of how the Islamic State uh, operated and also how we need to think about it. So just off, off the top, the, the three core challenges, and these are going to echo some of General Wolf's remarks, are of course how, um, how the Islamic State is a terrorism organization, an insurgent organization, and also at times a conventional military organization, and that has ramifications for how you fight it. Uh, I think that there have been assumptions behind our planning that the Islamic State just does terrorism or just does insurgency. Um, and yet when you look, and it's not in the paper, but when you look at strategic campaign, campaign planning that the Islamic State went through inside Iraq and Syria, it's very evident that, that there's a lot more behind the organization. So to focus on this just for terrorism or just for an insurgency means that we're missing the full spectrum of operations that the Islamic State uh, undertook and that's not even to go into the, the political, economic, and informational space. This is just on the military side, of course. Uh, the second assumption uh, that I want to talk about, and I'll go into these in depth, is um, the one about, the, about whether the Islamic State or a non-state actor can actually uh, field a conventional military force. And I think that the argument can be made very clearly from the work here that the Islamic State had a conventional army on the ground. Um, and you know, it, it is reminiscent, I think, of some of the early analysis that I saw on the Islamic State uh, that actually did not get enough traction uh, before we saw the caliphate declared. Um, and then the third point that I'll go into is, again, the ideological purity of the Islamic State, which, which really goes after the assumption of um, that there is a, a core group of radicals and ideologues leading the sheep behind them who don't understand what they're undertaking. Um, and you can see very clearly that, that um, for the Islamic State, the ideology was there. And then I'm going to add with, end with just a, a few bits and pieces about how I think we should be thinking about this going forward and how we can actually apply the research um, for, for future analysis. Um, but in terms of how how terrorism is integrated into the campaign plan. And you know, the, the paper goes through some of the phases and where you actually see the shift from um, the insurgency in, in Iraq and Syria toward a more conventional force. And that was replicated inside of the organization itself of the Islamic State. Um, but also, uh, and you know, one of the, the great things to do would be to marry this up with the events on the ground. Um, but the actual development of the battle space where the Islamic State actually started driving in traditional conventional formations down the road. You know, um, it was when uh, Mosul fell, I think that people came to realize that this was not just an insurgent force, it was actually um, driving uh, in, in a tactical formation into the city. Um, but also that the, that the Islamic State was able to use terrorism uh, and, and these acts of terror in order to achieve effects that, that, it, that facilitated its conventional army uh, to then come in and deliver the victories on the ground. Um, so, you know, as I was reading through the paper, I kept thinking back to Jessica Lewis McFate's work on the Islamic State in 2013 um, when, and 2014, when she was actually in analyzing how the Islamic State was maneuvering inside of Iraq. And she posited then uh, that there were uh, Iraqi army Ba'athist strategists at the back thinking through everything that's being done, um, where you saw somewhat of a pincer-like movement um, that was stressing the Iraqi security forces and pulling them out. And I think that, you know, as you, as reading the paper, it's great to see that uh, actually the documents bear, bear proof of this when you're looking forward and seeing uh, who the actual commanders were that were making the decisions. Um, so, you know, for one, you know, I think that our, our enemy in this space, uh, the Islamic State, uh, has been very agile in moving between or along the terrorism to conventional war spectrum. And we have been a lot less agile dependent upon how we're defining the threat. And the second point to, to really draw forward is the, the conventional army, um, which I've touched on a bit, um, but just to, to pull that forward, um, you know, I think, we again 
tend to assume that our, our adversaries, both the Islamic State and some of the Al-Qaeda groups that we fought, uh, don't study strategy, military strategy, um, that they haven't brought the same sort of understanding of history um, and how the battle space works uh, so that they aren't actually planning at that strategic level. Um, and you know, I've seen through what, what Craig and his co-authors put forward, um, they were outlining how not only was the Islamic State actually recruiting for this type of expertise, so in addition to the doctors and engineers and the calls that we had heard uh, when the Islamic State hit social media, uh, but actively trying to recruit uh, former mil military officials who would bring to bear this type of expertise, but they were also training for it. Um, so running a military academy and um, actually studying the doctrine. And again, you know, it's, it's you know, very well documented here, um, but it's not the first time that I've seen it. So it's come through in Yemen, for example, where um, we, we ran a project years ago looking at Al Qaeda's mid-level operational commanders. They actually went through an officer's school um, and they read all of the, the traditional military uh, strategists and ways of war in order to understand the battle space. So again, you know, we tend to, to dismiss our, our adversaries as not understanding uh, how military planning works. Uh, and I think very clearly here, we have laid out in depth um, evidence that the Islamic State in particular has been able to both capture that knowledge and then exploit it and integrate it into its own strategy, into its own comprehensive strategy that is not just the military campaign plan. And um, so, you know, the last the last bit is the ideological ideological purity. And you know, I've spent a lot of my work looking at how the Salafi jihadi ideology influences the strategy. Um, but the, the thing that struck me here is how doctrinaire the Islamic State has been all the way down to the rank of the foot soldier. Um, and there are assumptions in other groups, and I would say, you know, especially from the Al Qaeda side, much more willingness to work with ideological impurities. Uh, the idea that as long as we have the same short term, uh, short term objectives or objectives on the battlefield, we can work together in this space. Um, you know, that's, that's okay on the Al-Qaeda side for the Islamic State, it's very much not okay. Um, and that, you know, it's come through in some of the research on uh, how the Islamic State organizes as a society, um, but less so on the military side. It's really the first time that I've seen um, the ideo ideological test and also the uh, enforcement of that belief down at the foot soldier level when, you know, fundamentally foot soldiers are following their officer, their commander, what they believe doesn't matter so long as they do what they're told. Um, so the focus on belief here, I think comes back to something that's really integral to how the Islamic State perceived itself, which is not just that it was delivering the caliphate, but that it was fundamentally freeing, and I'm using that term very liberally here, freeing Muslims by introducing them to the, the true form of Islam per its interpretation. I think there's a lot of pushback <laughs> Uh, within Muslim society generally about whether the Islamic State has any right to claim Islam. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at it, I think, you know, it also resonates in terms of lessons learned from the Anbar awakening and the experience that the Islamic State had, the Islamic State in Iraq, had inside of Iraq in the mid 2000s, where it was willing to work again with some other groups that were not totally pure in terms of on board with the Zarqawi ideology. Um, and that was, I think, part of its undoing. And so you can see the Islamic State correcting uh, over time, going back to what General Wolf mentioned, where this is an evolving, learning, adaptive organization, and it's learned the lessons of the, the Anbar awakening, and it will learn the lessons again from its recent setbacks in Iraq and Syria. And then I think the, the kind of way to take this research forward uh, that really struck me is um, you know, the idea that the Islamic State started as an insurgent force, developed into a conventional force, and then moved back into um, an, a, a low-level insurgency guerrilla force. Um, you know, so there were phase changes in terms of how the Islamic State was organized based fundamentally on a leadership assessment of how strong it was and where it was in the fight. Um, so the question then is looking forward, what are the indicators we want to see that would show that the Islamic State is identifying another phase change. Um, because I would say almost every single analyst missed the phase change inside of Iraq uh, when it decided to move from 
uh, actually very powerful insurgency into a conventional uh, force organization that was able to compete to some degree with, with the actual trained state security forces. Um, and what should we then be looking for in other parts of the world farther afield where the Islamic State is not yet to that level of insurgency, but is it going to develop in such a way that it, that it is going to start rebuilding the state outside of Iraq and Syria. And so, um, you know, here I'm thinking about the African space where there's a lot less visibility on some of the places where these groups are operating and we haven't quite seen them um, evolving the way that Iraq and Syria did. Um, but there should be some parallels that we can at least line up for analysts to start raising alarm bells so that we aren't faced with a similar situation. And so I will end my remarks there since I'm much more interested in the, the question and answer and also in hearing uh, Craig explain some of his and his co-authors research questions. Um, but thank you so much again for this opportunity to speak. Excellent, thank you, uh, Katie. And um, again, um, uh, please uh, check out uh, Katie's Hudson uh, article. It's been made available in the uh, chat there. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, uh, also uh, for everyone listening in, um, please use the Q&A uh, the Q &A, uh, function to post up uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, don't wait uh, till the end. Um, and uh, finally, we have uh, Craig um, going over the major findings of his latest paper for the ISIS files. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Herrero. Um... General Wolf and Katie, thank you for those comments. Uh, there's a strategy here and that's get smarter people than you are to explain your paper to everybody. And, and so since they did the, the majority of the work and quite excellent work better than I could have done, uh, I'll, I'll stick to uh, showing some snippets from the paper to encourage people to read it uh, uh, and try to tie into those comments as best I can. But thank you, I'm big fans of both of you, what both of you do in your respective roles uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, so real quick, uh, the methodology was to use Islamic uh, ISIS files, but also to kind of triangulate with a lot of other sources, primary sources, like Katie said, the, the, the best part of this project, kind of a nerd dream was to, was to get access to primary sources and then try to figure out what it means. I, I wasn't sure quite what it meant at first, and it took a long time to try to tease out some, some things, but uh, working as a team always does that. So having, a, having team members uh, really great team members, um, really helped a lot. Um, you know, this is a part history of the Diwan al Jun, but it's also an interrogation of the files. It's an attempt to put together what the military calls a military order of battle, uh, which was an elusive target. I'm not sure if we got quite there, but we tried. Uh, but also to see how the Diwan al Jun manages a hybrid army as both Katie and uh, Terry talked about, right? This, not just the morphing back and forth, but part insurgency, part unconventional or regular, and then part conventional, uh, which is a little bit of a challenge for most uh, armies. The research question we settled on after a while was, was, what is the ideological fixation that reaches all the way down to the ranks as both of our panelists uh, talked about? Down to foot soldiers, right? What, why, why does that make sense? How is that efficient and effective? How does that compare with others, other uh, armies in the past and insurgent armies? So I'll share uh, some slides here. Let's see if I can do that. All right, can you see my presentation here? Can you see it? Okay. So um, let's talk about, this is a grouping we came up with. It's not one that we found. But in the, uh, in the paperwork and the archives for each of these offices, we kind of lumped them together in headquarters, logistics, administrative, special skills management, and then human resourcing. Although we did not find anything that necessarily grouped them in that way. That's how we looked at it uh, and found document, archival documents for each of these to show the type of organization, the level of depth, uh, the specialization, uh, even the skills, the, the the understanding, and this goes quite back a ways back in the organization of how to how to specialize certain skills like air defense, which is quite technical, 
uh, develop experts on that and then push them out into the force as uh, General Wolf talked about as almost like a what, what the Americans would call a Title 10 uh, responsibility to train, man and equip and then uh, you know, push them out into the force. Now, this is just an example of one of the uh, conceptualizations we came up with. Again, this is not necessarily theirs, but the departments are uh, theirs. Here's the order of battle. Uh, an in, a recent interrogation of um, one of the high-ranking delegated committee members uh, broke down the the uh, the army of the caliphate into four different parts uh, as best he could. It's quite it's not quite clear exactly what those are. So we tried to build uh, an order of battle, if you will, and some of the ones on this screen, like the Al Furqan Division, Western Nineveh, and the Al Muta Division in Eastern Nineveh. Uh, you know, are are exemplified in the ISIS files themselves because that's where a lot of these files were found. So we saw a lot of evidence of uh, soldiers within these particular units, and then we tried to build out from there. Um, just of note, uh, the Army of Dabiq was really a foreign fighter formations that were uh, similar language group. They were grouped in similar languages and then fed into uh, piecemealed into different. Uh, uh, Walayas, different provinces, different sectors uh, for the fight. Uh, the Am Army of Al Usra is really hard to find anything on, but it seemed like it was a propaganda slash commando unit uh, that we really didn't see a lot of uh, action for. I'm not really sure what happened to them. And then the Army of the Walaya is even more confusing, but it seems to be uh, local unit, both local units in the provinces, but also some of the specialized forces that the uh, the department would piecemeal out to its its uh, its commanders on the front. Uh, here is uh, this is from Ayman El Tamimi's archives, but it kind of helped us piece together the relationships that General uh, Wolf alluded to. This idea of force providers. So the force providers, the Dabiq Army and the Emir. Uh, and the the sub commander within the particular sector, but still had to uh, run these leave chits through uh, the Nineveh sector of the Diwan al Jun. So the the idea that this is a, a relatively bureaucratically complex uh, arrangement where forces are provided to these, but they have they have dual chains, uh, one reporting and one commanding, if you will, one administrative. One, one administrative reporting, one command. Uh, so this is uh, an example of that. General Wolf mentioned this, uh, as did Katie, and that's the uh, looking at the structure from one of the files. This is really coming out of their training academies where they're training what uh, these units look like and are supposed to uh, be structured as. And you can, the, the very interesting thing that we we started to fixate on was this idea of a Sharia advisor at both the uh, battalion level and all the way down into the platoon level, which raised a lot of questions for us and caused us to do some research outside of the Islamic State to, to understand when armies or militaries are interested in putting political religious figures, if you will, uh, down to uh, down to these militaries, if you will. Uh, the Soviets had commissars, but it was quite different. Uh, it seemed like a, a quite different than that. The, these People were not minders from the from the ISIS files. It looked like, in some ways, they were like co-commanders. It might be too strong a word, but they also did investigations, JAG, uh, military police, or even kind of IG uh, investigator general type of investigations in the unit, wrongdoing within the unit. They were interested in wrongdoing uh, and ensuring that people were living according to the rules of the Islamic State. Um, and we found that to be pretty uh, extraordinary. Uh, to tie into some recent research that's, uh, or primary sources that have been released at West Point, and that's on the current Amir uh, Al Maula. Uh, if looking back at that, doing some research on those primary sources, uh, as the Sharia and Mosul, he was uh, of the Islamic State of Iraq, he was already working uh, he, he said this in his interrogations, he was already working to in, integrate advisors, uh, Sharia advisors, so religious uh, figures into the security, military and the media elements 
Uh, and so they were integrating, they were cross pollinating as early as 2007. So when you when we saw these documents here, and then the Malif files where this happened to be a snippet in the investigation, it helped make help us make a connection. This is something that the group has been doing for some time. Uh, the original structure, which is adopted from Al Qaeda uh, back in the aughts, early aughts, even in the 1990s, the, that was the original structure of the group. Uh, but by 2007, they're already uh, making some some somewhat sophisticated um, hybrid departments and mixing the, the the specialties here, which I thought was was pretty interesting. This got to something we talk about quite a bit in the paper, and that's what is the rationale for having a Shari all the way down into battalions and then, um, you know, co-commanding in some ways, at least according to the routing of the ICE, some of these ISIS files. Uh, one is, you know, what all militaries like, which is uniformity and this strive for a common purpose. And you can get that in in um, certain type of uh, performative actions. It could be formations, it could be standing together and shouting the Ranger Creed together and then committing to living it. So you can see some echoes of that in other conventional armies. Uh, but I think it is clearly, they put a lot of work in screening out uh, and accepting people they felt were uh, adaptable or moldable to their ideology and then uh, educating them and their perspective properly, and then trying to ensure that they live the ideology. Uh, War Spoils and Booty, the way that this organization has funded itself for some time, which is why it's somewhat resistance or resilient to uh, counterfinancing efforts is War Spoils and Booty. Uh, however, that in, uh, in looking through past archival evidence of this group as it evolved, that's been a problem for them because of corrupt leaders who, who ran off with money or uh, fights and dissension in the ranks about who got what. So they have very strict rules of that. Who enforces those rules? The religious legal advisor, the Shari. The uh, application of violence, uh, Al Maula talks about that in his interrogation to tie into that again. He said, as the Shari of, of Mosul, he spent a lot of time sanctioning violence, um, whether it was uh, assassinations of rival political figures for apostasy or um, things like kidnapping for ransom and for, again, for apostates and not for what they would consider to be good Muslims. So uh, Maula, when he was the Shari at Mosul in 2007, said that's what he spent a lot of time doing was, was regulating the application of violence by an irregular uh, group that's doing you know, is conducting irregular warfare. And then finally, we saw some evidence of, of, of the regulation of the Yazidi slave trade. Those are there's some really good articles uh, out there by Revkin and Wood and Revkin has written several pieces about that. But once again, uh, that popped up in the ISIS files as uh, you know, one, partly as compensation for soldiers, but then two, that needed to be regulated. Who regulates that? It's not necessarily the commanders. It's actually these religious uh, legal leaders. Um, one of our interesting finds, it was uh, in the ISIS files, was something that we have in uh, chapter four of the ISIS reader, Hororo, Charlie Winter, who's a colleague of ours and and myself, uh, we had put that in. Charlie uh, was fascinated with that, as well as a similar pu uh, publication about to those entrusted to the media, which was from 2010. This one is like a leadership uh, principles. It's somewhat Maoist, you know, treat the population well and, and those kind of things. But really, they're not necessarily, um, you know, they're, they're not newsworthy, but they're, they're a long list of, of what leaders should do uh, to, to be a good leader, uh, founded in the Leadership Academy in Mosul in 2015-16. Uh, Rook Minnie found it and uh, she had brought it back and then explained to me what exactly it was. And I recognized, I said, oh, we actually have that in our book. That's something that's been around for a long time. But this, uh, he was the very first minister of war. So his, his writings, both on, on for military commanders, but also for the media has, has lasted uh, for some time. And, uh, you know, in a, he's not uh, a, 
he's not a, and I wouldn't call him an intellectual, but uh, I mean, he was involved in a lot of uh, atrocities. He was in the first, very first Berg video uh, as well. So he's, he had long standing in the organization, but they're still teaching him uh, just to show you that, that longevity and uh, the, the memory that um, the General Wolf referred to about this organization. And then last slide is Hororo, Charlie and I wrote a paper recently that I'll just kind of share some things, some reflections on since we wrote this uh, paper on the, uh, the Islamic State Department of Soldiers. And that's how, how, does, how does this one organization in Iraq and Syria uh, impact the globe as, um, as Katie was talking about in her remarks. And that's, uh, we called it the routinization, meaning that how they are, um, how they are adapting once again to being an insurgency at, in their home core, which is, you know, they've been there before. So they've been in it, they were an insurgency and then, um, almost became, you know, shrank down to almost a terrorist group and then back into an insurgency, then into a hybrid conventional force, back into a low level insurgency. Uh, these phases that, uh, that can, you can understand from Mao and they, they quite literally plagiarized from them. Uh, but it's interesting to note that, you know, it's been, you know, understanding this group's evolutions from phases has been dismissed as, you know, uh, this is a religious group, not a political group. And I, I, would, I would argue for a while about that one. Um, what are they exporting? This military expertise that they've developed, culturated, and then um, are, you know, have a lot of experience from their previous campaigns. Most of those people are dead. But the current campaign, I think one of the ideas that they have is that uh, through fighting, through warfare, and through the gaining of experience, uh, we become a stronger organization that then has some value to others. And, and that military expertise is what they're, uh, what they are sending to these global affiliates around the world from West Africa to East Asia. Uh, some of it's done through remote advising. Some of it's actually uh, sending experienced cadre to them or bringing them to Syria during the caliphate period or even before 2013, 2014, we've got evidence for that and then training them up and then sending them back. And then finally sending advisors into the field. We, um, in this paper, we, we note several instances, uh, IS West Africa, but also Libya where they've actually sent uh, advisors and in some cases even senior leaders to, to kind of help direct the fight in those local areas. Uh, leadership training, as we mentioned in the academy and as um, Katie mentioned about training leaders is something that they are doing forward. They are also making sure that there's leadership succession and leaders are safer uh, because of their value and importance. Also the counterterrorism leader targeting, uh, they understand very well. Uh, they're pushing media and financing as well, obviously, but ideology, just the same idea of having, there's certainly a shortage of qualified religious advisors and scholars to send down to platoon levels, even in Iraq and Syria, and certainly during their um, during times that they're stressed, and certainly not when they're in low-grade insurgency doing cells. They can't do that, uh, but when they scale up, they are able to do that, and that, and that kind of ties in with one of the themes of the paper, which is the, the ad hadocratic nature of how adaptive they are, how how they are able to morph from these different phases back and forth. Uh, they've, they've got some experience, not just in operating in each of those phases from building to uh, you know, contesting on multiple fronts to conventional and then back down, but they've also probably routinized some of that. It's built into some of, of their uh, institutional knowledge, if you will. And then, uh, yeah, I've already talked that last one. Okay, so with that, I will, shut up and turn it over to questions here let me stop sharing okay hopefully that was enough of a taste of the paper that people might be interested in reading it right thanks craig i mean i i, I think let, let's just jump straight into this discussion we've got a few questions coming in but um i i'd, I'd probably like to just start with um that that the the, the last point that craig made 
there because I think it kind of um, captures a lot of the sentiments that we've heard throughout this panel. We hear constantly about um, the Islamic State at movement as an organization, the structures and processes within this organization, that it learns, that it adapts, that there's strategic depth. Um, I guess I'm, I'm interested, uh, 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 Katie and uh, Terry, uh, from an organizational perspective, I think we can all understand and appreciate that this expansion and contraction over time, um, when you're in an organization that's doing that, it's a organizationally traumatic um, thing to go through, really, especially when you take into consideration the strategic context within which uh, this is occurring. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm interested to know what your thoughts are in terms of organizationally, what is it about the Islamic State? What is it um, about it structurally and in terms of its processes? Perhaps even if we're getting a bit more abstract, I suppose the culture within the organization that, that, that enables it to um, expand and contract as strategic conditions change. Uh, Katie, perhaps if you could. Um... Yeah, it's a, a great question and I'm afraid I won't have a perfect answer for it. Um, but I, I think one of the core uh, characteristics that has enabled the Islamic State to be able to go through these phases um, is the ideology itself and the subscription and adherence of the, the, the core leaders and the people that are moved into positions of power uh, within the organization to that ideology. Uh, because when you look at uh, Salafi Jihadism in particular and how the Islamic State uh, understands it and, and Cole Bunzel has done a wealth of research on, on the Islamic State's understanding of this ideology it really does provide a roadmap in terms of the way forward, what needs to be done during certain phases, what conditions need to be present. Uh, and so, you know, it's this idea that if the conditions shift, then fundamentally the entire organization and the effort shifts. And so, you know, for, for the listeners who aren't quite familiar um, with this, you know, the, the basic breakdown is looking and analyzing, uh, creating a, an analogy between uh, modern day events and the historical precedents of how Islam spread initially after uh, the Prophet Muhammad and the Salaf. And um, so the idea that, um, you know, there's a Mecca phase, a Medina phase, and then a return to Mecca, and then the expansion um, of, of the Caliphate out from the Arabian Peninsula, the Islamic State really moved forward with that as well. And I think that, um, you know, if you really do adhere to what the Islamic State believes in, uh, it allows leaders to be a little bit more fungible in terms of how they see themselves within the organization um, because it's no longer completely, I'm sure it's still there, about personality politics. Um, and so you're able to see kind of this, this pragmatism come forward in terms of what needs to be done in order to continue to advance your overall purpose and objective, which is uh, to establish, or in this case, I guess, return or, or um, revive the Islamic State uh, and the Caliphate here on earth. Uh, th thanks, Katie. Uh, 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 Terry, do you have anything to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in, in your insights in terms of, I guess the, for, 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 for one of a better phrase, the organizational nuts and bolts that are involved in, 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 in this contraption and expansion. I think it complements um, what Katie has said about the ideological driver. Yeah, I think when you add when you add to uh, Katie's ideas about this ideological underpinning, right, which fuels the the true believers and the leadership, then you add to that a willingness to um, for global expansion. It's the franchisement, right? And so when you look at you know when, when I when when I sat down and would look at the the emerging branches and affiliates, there were originally about 11, 10 or eleven dash branches. And again, it's based on how different organizations pledge allegiance at the time to Baghdadi. What I would always wonder would be how did you know how many new startups were there in terms of a group which actually stood up and said, "I'm Dosh, I'm out here in a certain place." I could only find one. It was Libya. It was in Darna, 
you know, everywhere else, it were they were other groups that had that were fighting against local authorities or inside of a nation state that suddenly pledged allegiance to to Daesh core in Baghdad. So, you know, by my count, there were about 50 different groups that had pledged allegiance. Now, some of them were out in the there were merely affiliates. Others were others rose to the level of branches where they perhaps also started to get some core assistance. So I found a very adaptable, you know, if you will, a very adaptable leader set of leaders inside of, of Baghdadi's organizations that that were willing to take all comers with certain conditions. And when you marry that to these to these um, ideological underpinnings, that's what scared me in terms of an organization that had a global reach and, and marketed itself as a global enterprise. And not that they were going to provide a lot of assistance out to some of those branches or affiliates, but more importantly, that they marketed themselves. And so in a way, you can think of it as a series of fast food franchises, right? You know, we don't care if you become a Burger King or a McDonald's or a Kentucky Fried Chicken or a Pizza Hut, we'll take you. But these are some of the rules. And so, you know, hoist up the black flag, adhere to kind of our rule set, and you're in the enterprise. That's what scared me. And so um, the, the paper, you know, goes back and looks at, as, as Craig has so eloquently talked about, the core, the core enterprise and what they were doing. That may not exactly work out in the branch or affiliate spaces, right, where there's still kind of a, a small force that's fighting unconventionally against, against the government or local security forces. But you see it change as they gain more strength and in, in, the, in the area that Katie works so, you know, in research is so thoroughly. I think we're seeing that, you know, in, in the Sahel and we're seeing, you know, Al Qaeda and Daesh guys go back and forth to whoever will pay more or whoever has a better organizing construct at the time. Sorry for such a long answer. No, no, that's that, that's perfect. And I, I, I must take this opportunity to, to, to just very quickly go back to uh, Katie on this point because, um, and, and, and then I'll move to uh, Craig and talk about this contraction expansion dynamic specific to um, the military operations and the soldiers. But this, this, this uh, the ability for the Islamic State in a sense to absorb other organizations and, uh, and, and, and breakaway factions is actually um, a bit of a trademark for this organization. When it was largely focused on Iraq, it was very, very good at doing that. I mean, Craig's written extensively on that, of course, but in some of your uh, recent um, work, well, so much of your research has, you know, tracked the way that um, different Al Qaeda branches have evolved over time. But of course, breakaway factions from those have been absorbed into the Islamic State. And I know that I'm actually you, perhaps emphasizing too much of a top-down dynamic here where there's actually a lot of a bottom-up dynamic as well. And I'm, 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 I'm curious as to your thoughts uh, about the way in which the transnational dimension of the Islamic State movement has been able to, I guess, outcompete these Al-Qaeda uh, breakaways. I mean, doing something pretty dramatic, which is to break pledges that were originally made to bin Laden. Um, I, I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, um, it's actually been fascinating to watch. And, um, you know, now that we're at this stage, I no longer have to argue that the Islamic State is going to subsume everyone um, because, it, you know, it's no longer a discussion as to whether Al Qaeda still exists. It's very clear that the core will persist. Uh, but in terms of what the Islamic State was able to do, especially with the branches um, and uh, the, the groups that I've studied, which are out in Africa, uh, it, it was able to attract uh, the components of, of these local organizations that were unhappy with how Al Qaeda was running its business. Um, so, and this comes a little bit back to the, the way that the ways that Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, State both differ and are similar in terms of how they how the the, the senior leadership interacts with the uh, local affiliate leadership. But um, both Al Qaeda and the Islamic State actually have pretty strict guidelines um, in terms of what you can and cannot do. Um, you know what what those guidelines are obviously are different between the two organizations themselves. Um, but Al Qaeda has issued a uh, basically strategic guidance, and if you err from that guidance, 
um, you really face a lot of uh, backlash from the leadership. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Boko Haram never really came into Al Qaeda and why we saw Boko Haram then try to try to go to the Islamic State and actually Shakao uh, didn't fit the requirements for the Islamic State either because he was in some ways too extreme and, and too undisciplined in how he was engaging in his insurgency in Nigeria, um, which led to the establishment of the Islamic State West Africa, which was a splinter from Boko Haram. Um, but in terms of how the Islamic State was able to really capture these organizations, uh, it provided a very clear ideology. So some of the leaders, Abu Sahrawi in the Sahel, for example, um, he is known for having been the more radical leader on the ground, trying to push Al Qaeda to move faster. There was this lag in what Al Qaeda was doing in Timbuktu. And he was saying, no, we control, we should be actually instituting and implementing Sharia and Al Qaeda I think you know learned a different lesson from what happened in Iraq in in, in during the Anbar awakening, where you know Al Qaeda saw the the break from the population, the loss of support among among the local tribes as really the the and its subsequent isolation as the weakening of Al Qaeda and the Islamic State and Zarqawi uh, well he's dead um, but Baghdadi then took away that um, you know, it wasn't the break with them, but that they didn't enforce Sharia enough. Um, and you can see that really come forward in how these affiliates are interacting. And then of course, um, as I, I believe Craig mentioned, um, the Islamic State sent out and has been able to you know, put very limited investments into certain affiliates and they're game changing. Um, so um, sending out a few leaders with, with TTP, with, you know, to be able to de develop expertise in tactics, techniques, and procedures, and um, sending out a little bit of financing so that you can pay the fighters a little bit more than your competitor. Um, it is a competitive space after all. Uh, and you know, in, in that way, start to bring them together. And the easiest way for the Islamic State was to use its phenomenal messaging. Um, so for these groups to be able to send in a video or participate in a global campaign where the Islamic State says, we're going to show the Islamic State marketplaces. Um, and you see marketplaces from areas where uh, ISIS has control uh, from across the world that these, these groups participated in um, really created this idea of a global enterprise quite early on when if you looked at the capabilities, the, 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 the um, international sense was not quite there. Um, it was much more, it, you know, the, the capabilities of the group followed the media um, in some places. Yeah, thanks, Katie. So, Craig, we've kind of um, gone out to the transnational now. I, you know, I'd, I'd really like to dig in to a very specific part of the Islamic State, which is its military operations. Um, you know, really the underlying story of your paper is this is this historical evolution of one of the original kind of functions, one of the original units, the military operations, and the way that it contracted and expanded along with the larger, um, the, 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 in a sense, the larger apparatus. And so just if you could walk us through some of the key organizational dynamics that, that, that allowed one of the original functions all the way back to Zakawi to evolve the way that it did expand and then contract. Yeah, I'll try to distill that because it is it is a fascinating story. And I think it's one that is still confused. It's confusing to me, right? And I, I tried to, I tried to, some good feedback I got on the review of the paper was, you you seem to be very definitive about what the Islamic State looks like, but we're really not sure what it looks like. I, well, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but it was great feedback. It was from Ayman Al-Tamimi. And um, I was always perceptive on that. You know, I think there's a paradox that, the Islamic State themselves describes them as decentralized, right? And then most people just assume that insurgencies are decentralized. Like they're just these little cells that are out there doing things. And, um, you know, they have very little ties to the leadership and stuff. But then you look at the bureau the charts that I showed and you're like, no, 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 they're an immense bureaucracy that's very dense, very specialized. They have experts. That's what bureaucracies do. Um, you know, so what that, that paradox is very difficult to try to understand. Um, how did that bureaucracy evolve this, the wing? Certainly it's dependent on the timing, the, the, the strategic environment that this group is evolving in. As Katie pointed out, during the awakening, it has to go to ground. 
um, because it has rivals coming after them and the tribes as well. And so, you know, that's one thing I think is still under research, trying to understand that dynamic. Um, but I'd say they're just decentralized in certain aspects, like say guerrilla warfare, which is not entirely, you know, it's somewhat intuitive. You can have low level folks doing that. And then they have other centralized functions. Uh, the specialty skills I mentioned, uh, financing of course is highly centralized and regulated as I pointed out, as many other people have pointed out. Uh, and the media, as Katie mentioned, very centralized and micromanaged, right? And to to the chagrin of our own psyops people who feel that, you know, if only they were given freer hand, they could do what the Islamic State's doing. Like, no, the Islamic State has more control over their material than than you do. Um, so there there's this different thing. I think Katie brought up a really interesting point, which is as early as 2007 and some of the internal disputes within the Islamic State, early Islamic State of Iraq, um, there's a famous episode and they were, they're already talking about a different manhaj. They're already saying that the Islamic State manhaj versus the Al Qaeda manhaj. And one Al Qaeda loyalist, you know, takes offense to that and then defects back to Al Qaeda, defects back to Al Qaeda. They're all Al Qaeda, but defects from them saying that these folks, you know, are kind of arrogant and have their own way that they say that they're doing things. And I think that's an important understanding. I know Tori Hammings talked about it a little bit in his most recent publications. A lot of people chalk up the influences on this organization and how it changed were on the Bathists, but I kind of find that laughable. I mean, they have former Bathists within, you know, former military people, let's be clear, former military officers who've got some, you know, education, some staff college, and they understand what bureaucracies can do for, for an insurgency, even one that's facing the counterterrorism pressure that this one has. So they've had to evolve a very unique hybrid structure, partly decentralized, partly centralized, always under counterterrorism pressure. It's got to have security. It's got to be air gapped. It's got to have security in a lot of different places. But at the same time, it has to still communicate. It still has to give orders up and down. It still has to green light assassinations, which I've seen throughout to, to include the awakening period. They're able to use their communication structure, which is pretty old school, to you know, eliminate rival tribal leaders that are that that were, you know, causing them all the problems during the awakening. And so um there, there are certain aspects of that, you know, going back again to the Bathist thing, which I've beaten that drum a few times, Al Qaeda is just as interested in structure. They're just as interested in military experience and gaining it. They just don't have a, they don't have a method to get it, which is why they have always tended to try to recruit uh, former military. Uh, and they've, they've been successful at that. They're former military people in Al Qaeda and they're certainly the Islamic State had more opportunities to, to kind of gain ac access to that expertise. But going back to the ideology piece, they, ne they never brought in anyone who wasn't going to, be, to adopt, adopt the ideology in full. And that was their litmus test, you know, and as, as we understand it, that is, you know, people like Abu Muslim al-Turkmani, who is the head of the Diwan al Jund at this time period during the ISIS files, quite, quite possibly joined before the invasion of Iraq as a already radicalized uh, under Abu Ali al-Ambari, his mentor, who also led the organization all the way up to 2016 and was killed by uh, the coalition. So these are these are some these are some really sophisticated, not sophisticated, but complex dynamics to try to understand. And it really defies these really simple labels like, oh, they're decentralized or, oh, they, you know, this is clearly from the Stasi in Eastern Germany structure. Like, no, sorry for that rant. No, I, I, I think something that's important to pick up with, with, with the, the, some of the latter points that you were making there is the importance of personalities, of actual human beings, um, not just filling the ranks, but who bring certain um, attributes as, as, as people, as leaders, as thinkers, um, strategists, as practitioners. Um, and I, I, I think if, if we could just talk a little bit about some of those key individuals that shaped um, the Islamic State's military operations um, over time, if you kind of um, if, if, if there were one or two 
personalities and I'm talking about like like these these people because of who they were because of what they brought they had this influence which was that which was which was not something that you could necessarily attribute to some other person you know that that they'd brought something special to this mix is there anyone like that yeah I mean I'll keep this short and that's uh I don't think there's an answer to that I, and I I mean that in the sense one the counterterrorism pressure has been so immense that you know they all of their leaders that have that military experience from early Iraq war under AQI Zarqawi's peers as Katie was talking about they're dead I mean they they've they've long gone they've probably groomed successors uh, all indigenous a lot of them Iraqis and Syrians uh, a few foreign fighters here and there that had some but honestly what you know, if you read the paper and go through the litany of the, the Diwando Jun leadership from 2004 on and the movement at writ large, there, it's a long list. And it's almost, it's impossible for me sometimes to understand looking at the out years like 2011, 2012, 2013, who's the genius behind this much longer comeback than we understand. And I, I have no idea who it is. It could be Sway Dawi. It could be uh, Balawi who, who planned the Mosul campaign that Katie talked about. It's quite brilliant campaign, dies before it even happens. And so the people, what's, it's no one person. I, I will caveat that and say that the overarching political leadership of the group, as, as Terry mentioned, has made critical decisions at certain points that people probably fought them on. Like we're going back to insurgency. And that saved the organization, unfortunately. Uh, but those are key leadership decisions at the political level, uh, which had massive ramifications for its affiliates afar. And yet they may they they tried to politically, you know, sequence that stand down that that collapse back into insurgency while we're still a global caliphate, right? How does that work? I didn't think it was going to work. Uh, so the political leadership is quite astute, and and obviously, like any political or any state or any you know, true, truly political organization, the politics and the policy are going to drive strategy. And they, they've gotten that right. Abu Bakr with his decision, Abu Omar made that decision in 20, 2007. We are going, we are going to, the, to the desert and because the pressure is too much, not from the Americans for sure, but also from their rivals that Katie mentioned. So I, you know, my answer is it's a, it's a cohort. It is a, it is a large group of people who think somewhat similarly, have adopted the Manhaj and uh, pass it on to their successors. And so, I, I mean, I really can't point out any one person, even Abu Hamsu, who I highlighted on the thing that he's just one of one of many. Uh, uh, Terry, I, you know, you, you've been at the forefront of the battle against ISIS. Are there certain personalities and leaders that I guess stood out to, to, to you either more recently or historically as having a disproportionate impact on the way that the organization thinks and strategizes or practices actually applies in the field? You know, Harlow, it's a great question. I, I think that, you know, I, my perspective has always been that this organization has planned to, to withstand loss of key leaders and that they've always had a, a plan that the number one or number two or number three guy was going to get killed. You know, the running joke was the worst job in the world is to be the number two guy because you could, you know, you could plan that you would be around for six or eight or 12 months. But, but so again, I keep going back to the glue and what holds this organization together. And I think it's this common vision, this these ideological underpinnings that that Craig has has highlighted again. And so when you marry up a common vision, a unifying organizational concept, and then this this ideological underpinning, that that gives you this this group of 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 adhere of core adherents that are are going to be around for, or at least have planned that this is not just a a five-year project. This is a project forevermore until they achieve their objectives. And so consequently, if you buy into that, it's not about, you know, killing a particular leader um, today, tomorrow, or the next day, because they've already planned for that. And so, you know, others have talked about how you defeat an ideological, how do you defeat this ideology? And that's, that's, that's our challenge, right? 
we've we and we've seen in their organization where they're centralized in ways that make sense you know you know the at least from a you know from how they ran their finances to how they ran their drone program to how they run their chemical weapons program to their propaganda their propaganda effort of putting propaganda and media people with every military operation so that every military operation assuming it was successful had a propaganda component even if it failed it had a propaganda component arguing that it was successful so so my point is that it's less about the leader i think you know people keep seizing on it's about the leader and does he have the religious legitimacy yeah that's probably important but ultimately they'll 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 carve their own story about how whoever is in charge now has the religious legitimacy, you know, regardless of how they want to portray that. So it's kind of their narrative, but but again, they 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 are this group of true believers. And I keep talking about this glue that holds this organization together. I mean, when you think about it, the losses, the leadership losses they've taken over, you know, umpty ump years now, and, and and they keep on ticking. They're like the old Timex watch commercial, you know, take a lick and they keep on ticking. Well, they're doing that. And so what, what enables them to do that? You know, most of us would have argued that the disruptive effect of the loss of all these leaders over the years would have been enough to torpedo an organization. This has not been the case. They have an incredible staying power. And so I, I kind of agree with Craig. Yeah, there are leaders that we kind of figure out, you know, the Baghdadis from the two different periods. But, but I think the missing period, as Craig just said, is what happened after, you know, after, Baghdadi, the former, was killed until Baghdadi, you know, the, you know, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi came into, into power. What happened during that period, which caused them to be so, you know, to be so resilient? Again, sorry for the long answer. No, no, that's great. I mean, Katie, I think that um, if you could add to this discussion on ISIS, but also kind of expand it out as, as well and, and, and kind of cover the AQ dimension, which I think is really important here, is that, um, you know, the Islamic State's kind of move towards a kind of a caliph and the nature of the, or the bonds of um, the, 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 the authority claim is quite different to the claim um, at the head of Al Qaeda. Um, certainly the kind of the charismatic kind of leadership, I guess, that Bin Laden kind of offered and that, 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 that very um, disrupted transition um, to, to, to or, or I should say troubled transition to Zawahiri. I mean, to, to, to what extent are the two leadership groups, um, oh, sorry, to what extent are the two leaders at the top or the leadership at the top of these two groups kind of in competition for credibility and authority? And to what extent is that, is that, is that kind of dusted? Well, you know, it's a great question. And I think at this point, um, you know, the, the, the competition has died down just by virtue of the fact that, um, you know, most of the, the veteran jihadis have made their choice um, between, the, between the two organizations. And now it's simply about the recruitment. And they really fundamentally offer two different vectors uh, to achieving this vision. Um, and it's very, very difficult, I think, if you, you know, want to be a, a starting Salafi jihadi to understand the intricacies of the ideology to be able to make really an educated choice between the two. So it's just catching, catching the would-be recruits as they're coming into the radicalization process and being able to direct them toward the, either the Islamic State um, ideology or the Al-Qaeda ideology, uh, whichever happens to be present on the ground. Um, but just to echo, you know, Craig and, and General Wolf's comments about leadership personality, we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of uh, the death of bin Laden and the Abbottabad raid. And I, you know, was going back and rereading what, uh, uh, what the White House was saying uh, after, after that raid and, and kind of the, the predictions, if you will, about what would happen to Al Qaeda. And a lot of it is true. Um, the, the idea was that Ayman al-Zawahiri was the presumed successor and he would take control of the organization. He would not be bin Laden. Uh, he would not have the charisma, the, uh, the stage personality and the management skills fundamentally to be able to replicate what bin Laden delivered to, to the organization. Um, but I think the, the key point that was missed in that the assumptions behind this was that Al-Qaeda was not just bin Laden. Um, and so, you know, Zawahiri comes in 
He is a dour, lackluster, uncharismatic leader with fewer jihadi credentials. Um, and you can kind of go through the long list of why nobody likes him as much as they liked bin Laden. Um, but he's kept fundamentally the organization running. Um, he's got a different management style. He's dealing with different conditions. Um, and Al Qaeda has weathered the storm uh, in a very, very fundamental way. And I actually think a way that's quite dangerous in the long term for the United States and for others, um, not just because of the distraction uh, due to the Islamic State's rapid rise and um, really global threat uh, when it came on the scene, uh, but also because of how Al Qaeda has evolved into these very local dynamics. Um, but again, you know, it had nothing to do. You know, it wasn't all boiled down into a single personality at the leadership level. Um, so while we like to think of this decapitation as something that is going to ultimately degrade, defeat the organization, um, it certainly feels good to take some of these, these leaders off the battlefield, especially holding them accountable for the, their actions or the actions of those they command. Um, but we must not kid ourselves that decapitation is going to be the way to eliminate their threat. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as we're kind of transitioning, moving this discussion over to counter strategy implications, I think, um, you know, a, a question that keeps popping up in, um, in, in the panels that we've been running has been, well, to what extent are the Islamic State's affiliates adopting its strategy, adopting its manhaj and actually applying it? Um, Craig, I mean, this is obviously a really central question at the moment for those who are grappling with the counter strategy implications of this global enterprise. I mean, to, to, to what extent do you think it's being applied practically? To what extent do you see it more as a propaganda framing um, from, 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 from both sides? I mean, where, where is the balance here? No. I mean, I'd really be interested to, to hear the others talk more on this with their, you know, both their recent experience and research, uh, since I really focus on the core. But um, I, you know, again, I think we have to be careful about putting us, you know, taking a simplistic look at, you know, this is just the Islamic State trying to create something over here so they can, you know, their woes at home, uh, home being is on, you know, Syria and Iraq, if that is home. I mean, I think it is home for most of, of the leadership, but, um, you know, that, I think that's just a simplistic way to do it. They're not trying to create distractions. They're not trying to, you know, pump up the brand artificially. I think one thing they understand about the media environment, uh, which is contrary to a lot of perceptions, is that you can't just, you can't pump up something. It's not going to stay pumped up for long. You actually have to do things. You have to have to, you know, uh, as Mao said, you have to have constant activity and that is what generates success. It's not, it's, it's the do not the say that's important. Um, um, so, you know, one thing I think they are doing, there's a question about, you know, what, what plans does ISIS have for Mozambique? And you could, you know, you could, you could have, replicate that question 50 times in 50 different places. And I think they have an idea. This is, this is not based off of any document because we don't capture these kind of documents. At least I haven't seen them. I mean, maybe we do. Um, I think there's an idea, and we wrote about this in, in our recent paper, and that's um, if you create enough, you know, one way to get counterterrorism counter pressure off of you is to create lots of and, and help fuel lots of insurgencies across the board so your opponents cannot focus on any one place. That's something they learned inside of Iraq. That's something they learned inside of Syria, that if you, if you flood the zone in Talafer, in Qaim, in Fallujah, we'll just go somewhere else and we'll make hay there. And that is how insurgencies are run. We go, to, we go to the areas that are weak. You can't be strong everywhere. As a government, any government across the world, you're gonna strong point somewhere. You're gonna protect something that's important to you. We'll take the rest. So it's this very, you know, it's this autocratic aspect that we talked about, but it's this pragmatism that um, I think successful insurgents have to have or they just don't they don't make it and that's you take you take what the others are going to give you and I think that's what they're trying to do if they can create enough enough if they can help fuel if they can help increase it, it certainly builds it, it fulfills their ideology which is clearly important to them uh, but strategically, it helps reduce pressure off of them in certain areas that are very important to them. It diffuses the efforts of the counterterrorism. It might even help 
in their general political their their objective, which is to exhaust the opponent. You know, not a trit them. They kind of trit us. They want to exhaust us so that we just give up and you know we go back to doing what we're doing and let them do what they're doing. I think that is is kind of what they're trying to do from an idea perspective. Uh, but I also think it's it's very it's not pragmatic. It's almost like just putting up a half court shot to see if you can make it. If not, you, you'll get plenty other chances. I mean, as we continue to kind of think about the counter strategy implications, I think it's important for us to remember that the conventional phase is an anomaly in the history of the Islamic State um, kind of movement. So when you look at it across time, but also when you look at it across space, kind of globally, um, um, you know, um, at reaching that threshold of Tamkeen where territory is controlled. Um, and so I guess, um, General, I mean, how should counter efforts, particularly from the US and its other kind of Western allies, how should it evolve, adapt, um, um, for this change, for the for, for, for this, what seems to be very, very different types of um, operations that are required, um, not just in different locations, but also at different times? Yeah, it's, great. it's a great question, right? So uh, my, my, I make two points. First, you can see it coming. You know, what's occurred in Mozambique isn't a surprise. I mean, what occur, has occurred down in, in the Sahel, in, in the in car, it's not a surprise. Afghanistan, it's not a surprise. And the problem is we, you know, our, uh, our assistance becomes reactive. Uh, we wait until it hits a certain level and, and, and then we suddenly want to help, you know, as I said earlier, you know, this race. And the race is, is the growth of the security forces of the good guys faster than the rate of growth of the violent extremist organizations. And in most cases, the answer is the violent extremists are growing faster than the good guys are. Yet we see the good guys grow, we see the bad guys growing faster and we ignore it until we hit a crisis point. And then we rush and flood the zone with assistance or we try to, not just we, and I'm, and I'm just talking about the proverbial we, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the EU, it's Europeans, it's other bilateral mechanisms, and it's too late. And, and so then the challenge is the bad guys, these groups that have pledged allegiance to Daesh or Al Qaeda have gained a foothold that the security forces can't, um, can't take back. And then you're into the, into all the other problems of why the, why an insurgent group, you know, has gotten a foothold in the first place, the governance problems, the fragility problems, the economic issues, you name it. But we can see this coming. When you, if you map and overlay all these indicators, and then you look at how groups start to change allegiance and how they start to gain strength, it's not like people aren't talking about this out in social media and other spaces. Unfortunately, we tend to ignore it until we hit a crisis point. And then, and then it's almost unrecoverable. Um, and everyone can see it coming. The practitioners on the ground can see it coming. The assistance people on the ground, the NGOs, the IGOs can, NGOs can see it coming because they're talking about it and it's seeing their ability to operate limited and constrained because they're out there in interesting ways. So um, I, think, I, I think there are, the tools are out there. So in some cases, they're predictive in nature, the predictive management that can occur. And then the challenge for policymakers is act sooner, not later. Because once you hit the crisis point, then it's too late and flooding the zone with assistance, it can't be absorbed and it, it's late to need. And, and then the intelligence community and the others that are watching these spaces say, yeah, we told you so. The indicators were, com were completely there. I use, I use an example. I can remember talking to um, some NGOs about um, the Philippines and morale uh, when all of that flared up. And uh, you know, I, I happened to bring a bunch of, of, of smart folks together and I asked who, you know, a simple question, who saw this coming? And one hand went up in the room, and it was uh, a, a, an individual from a civil security, uh, a CSO, an NGO that said, "Yeah, I saw this coming, and I've been talking about this for you know for 18 months." And everyone just kind of ignored the indicators. And so that's our challenge, I think, right? It's how do you get people excited about the problem um, and, and try to get the right resources brought to bear sooner versus later? Yeah, I mean, Katie, we. 
we have to kind of address Mozambique. It's been brought up several times here. I see uh, Sylvie Figueredo had ask a question about Mozambique as well. Um, the program's had two panels over the last month on Africa and Mozambique is the recurring question for obvious reasons. I mean, to, to, to what extent were the actions, you know, were the operations on the ground kind of reflective of kind of Islamic State thinking to what extent was it a continuation of the kind of operations you've seen for some time? Um, um, yeah, I mean, your, your, your thoughts on those, um, those trends would be really valuable, I think. Great, and I think that it ties very well into General Wolf's point where, you know, the insurgency in Mozambique it was there before the Islamic State. Um, so it was something that was ongoing, it was a local threat uh, and really just a, a Mozambican problem uh, that, you know, they could deal with as it was hurting the, the ability of, of companies to invest in some of the resource extraction uh, and the, the local dynamics, but fundamentally, um, if you had asked somebody who was an expert in Mozambique, and now there are many more in Washington than there used to be somehow, um, but the, you know, they could have talked about the problems and they could have said, you know, yes, there's an insurgency. Yes, this is all going on. And I think the, the important thing that happened here is that there were uh, early indicators that were somewhat dismissed and, you know, to beat one of my dead horses that I like to tackle, uh, you know, there is a, a tendency among analysts to try and downplay the role of international, transnational terrorist organizations, so Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State coming into a theater uh, and grafting onto these local insurgencies, not because the analysts don't see, you know, the, the uh, foreigners coming in or the slight change in tactics and procedures, uh, but rather because the grafting of the Islamic State onto a local insurgency in Mozambique, for example, um, and calling it the Islamic State, for some reason, everybody then wants to use a cookie cutter approach. Um, and you know, the local analysts know very well that that securitized approach in this area will not work, especially when the local security forces are actually feeding the problem. And, the, you know, and that's fundamentally what happened, right? Where you started to see this, this you know, a, a somewhat typical um, growth in the insurgency due to uh, some of the deficits in the local security forces and the actual response to it. And so, you know, for, for one, um, we as analysts need to be very disciplined in, in identifying the problem as early as we can um, and not simply ignoring it. Um, but two, I think the other bit is making sure that when we do identify the problem um, not simply saying, okay, now send in the troops. Um, because a lot of times the troops are not the answer. Um, and it is the civil society organizations that are better positioned actually um, to identify the grievances and try and work through not soft power um, to shift it. So, you know, where is Mozambique going? Um, I wish I knew. Um, I, and I don't have high hopes for it um, just because I have seen the responses actually not being coordinated in any real way. Um, there are, from the American side, there are some um, developments that are counter to our interests, um, including the attempt by Russian PMCs to insert themselves. They failed um, and are backing away. But, you know, fundamentally, the, the insurgency is tied into political grievances. Um, and without trying to address those, um, it's going to continue in some way, even if there's a military solution. Um, so, you know, the the desire to just treat this as a security threat um, is going to, to really push us in the wrong direction in Mozambique and, and globally. Um, and it really needs to be brought out of just the counterterrorism space and being talked about comprehensive. So looking at some of the fragility and stabilization programs um, that can actually deliver change uh, without secure, with, well, you need security in order to do this, um, but without um, just you know, fundamentally tracking bad guys. Um, because that's the way that you get into the cycle that has really inflamed Mozambique um, and allowed the Islamic State to send just a little bit in, um, you know, some money and some, some commanders uh, in order to elevate the ability of, of the local insurgency to change the planning and give them a little bit more meat to, to what they're doing. Uh, what a perfect uh, way to close uh, today's uh, panel. Thank you, uh, Katie, and perfectly timed. Uh, 
as well. Uh, on behalf of the program on extremism, I really want to thank uh, General Wolf, uh, Catherine Zoom, and, and Craig Whiteside uh, for their time today. The, 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 the uh, remarks have been excellent. I really appreciate um, the frank discussion that we've been able to have. And I'm um, pleased uh, we've provided links to the publications um, from our speakers today. Of course, encourage everyone to um, dive into those and uh, we'll um, uh, we'll have uh, Craig's paper will be uh, tweeted out over the next um, um, over the next few days. So please um, uh, take some time to have a look at those publications. And once again, uh, thank you, uh, General Wolf, uh, Katie, Craig, um, for your time. Thank you both for amazing comments and for taking the time to read. I really appreciate your informed comments. We do. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Until next time.